Hello, it's John Heaton, and today I'm going to do part two of my uh, How Do You Follow a Great Album. So again, just taking stuff from my collection. So thanks for all the people who commented on various albums on the first video, like The Doors and a few others. So thanks for that. They're not in my collection. They, they don't make it onto the list, uh, unfortunately. Um, but there is, there's one exception in my new list, uh, which I'll tell you about. Um, so I've got five albums which, which I think were a letdown after what I call is a great album, maybe um, not a great album by everyone's standards, but big albums for me, and this is the follow-up. So five albums which were a letdown after such an album as the follow-up, and five albums which were somewhat disappointing, so somewhere in the middle, and then five which maintained the very high standard of the, of the first one. So I'm starting off with... Um, a momentary lapse of reason, uh, which was the follow-up to the final cut in 1983, and I was going to have this in my first video, but uh, because I don't regard this as proper Pink Floyd, uh, I didn't include it. But then uh, I was talking to my son, and he he said, "Well, it is Pink Floyd, whether you like it or not." So I suppose it qualifies for my list. Uh, the final cut was, in my opinion, a great album, although some people think it was too dominated by Roger. But compared to this. It was uh, miles, miles above it. Uh, this is this was a very big disappointment on release. Not that I was expecting tremendous things without Roger Waters, but even even versus those limited expectations, it was uh, disappointing. Um, with a couple of a couple of reception, nice tracks, um, two or three of them. Uh, yeah, sorry to have. Oh no, the second one is one which I don't have in my collection, but. I heard it to bits because it came out when I was at university and uh, a lot of friends of mine had it so I, I've definitely listened to it many times um, and I could never get into it and uh, I don't want to upset those of you who like David Bowie's pe this period of his career because Niall, Niall Rogers I suppose did a quite a creditable job producing it. It was a huge hit commercially, um, but I'm, I'm talking about the, the album Let's Dance, which, which to me was a very disappointing follow-up to Scary Monsters from 1980, which had been so continued his groundbreaking work from the 70s. Um, and to me, Let's Dance, and I don't just not I'm not I'm no, not just not keen on it because it did well commercially that's got nothing to do with it really because there's a lot of albums which hit number one which I love um, I just felt it was treading a very safe path and uh, not as interesting musically as It's No Game or Ashes to Ashes or even Fashion is a better single if you want to talk about commercial um, so Scary Monsters for me was uh, the last David Bowie great album for a long while, um, and Let's Dance, the start of a downward, downward uh, path for for a while, for the whole of the eighties, really for me. Uh, sorry to have a second Eric Clapton album on the disappointing list. This is on the very disappointing list because it followed 1983's Money and Cigarettes, which was the first, not the first album I ever got, but it was the first rock concert I ever attended at St. Austell Cornwall Coliseum, 1983, May, was my birthday, I seem to remember. And um, I loved Money and Cigarettes, particularly Side One, loved Albert Lee's guitar playing along with Eric and Donald Duck Dunn on, uh, on bass. And uh, The Shape You're In, Ain't Going Down, I've Got a Rock and Roll Heart, um, Everybody Ought to Make a Change, there's just so many great tracks, Side 2 is not quite as good. But then when this album came out, it was a genuine uh, shocker for me because it was produced by Phil Collins and he's very heavy on the drum sound, which was characteristic for this time. And uh, I was struggling to like quite a lot of this album. I quite liked uh, See What Love Can Do, the second track, and I liked the cover of Knock On Wood. And I quite liked Something's Happening when Lindsay Buckingham guests. Forever Man was a decent enough single, but the rest of it is uh, substandard, in my opinion. So sorry, Eric. If I had to give an example of a really good follow-up from Eric in the 70s, it would be Backless, the follow-up to Slow Hand, which I thought was every bit as good as Slow Hand. Um, then we've got this James Taylor album, One Man Dog, which followed 
uh, followed up um, uh, mods, what's it called? The album with uh, You've Got a Friend. Uh, my, uh, hey, Mister, that's me up on the jukebox. I forget the name of the previous album, but this this was a big disappointment. Uh, I think I've bar barely played it two or three times, and it's been sitting on the shelf. Now, I put this one in the letdown category because. Whichever way you want to look at it, uh, it is a letdown. Now, it doesn't say it doesn't have its merits, and um, I think there's a quite a lot to be said for this album. Uh, I think Yoko's material is some of the best of her career. I think Lennon was going through a political period, and it's quite interesting to look back on that. But he was, I think he sacrificed a bit of his artistic uh, freedom by pinning himself to these causes and apart from anything else the songs became quite dated quite quickly because um, he's singing about current affairs as it were but uh, you know Woman is the Nigger is decent, New York City is decent, John Sinclair is decent so there's enough here to justify having the album but a come, as, as sure as hell it was a come down after Imagine, no question. Uh, this next one, it might surprise some of you. I put Love Over Gold in the, this is the B category, the somewhat disappointing. And um, whilst I bought this album at the time and I seem to remember I was fairly happy with it, I just haven't been playing it very much over the years. And I found it, um, it was the start of their decline, uh, really, because I, I look back on Dire Straits and their first three albums, to me, are head and shoulders above the rest of their work with a couple of exceptions at later songs. But um, Telegraph Road is a strong opener, but it's very reminiscent of Tunnel of Love. Um, and it does go on a long time. Um, it builds up quite nicely. And then Private, Private Investigation has got some beautiful classical guitar playing on it. And uh, But again, seven and a half minutes. Um, quite melodramatic, a little bit pretentious, but a decent song. But side two, I, I don't think I can say too much about it. Industrial disease is weak, it never rains is weak, the title track's okay. So not very consistent compared to making movies or communicate or the first self-titled album. Then we've got also in the B category, Traffic's follow-up to Low Spark of High Hill Boys in 1973, uh, shoot out at the Fantasy Factory. So. He replaced um, Jim Gordon with Roger Hawkins uh, on drums and David Hood on bass. Uh, Reebok still in there and Chris, Jim and Steve. Um, nice back cover, nice design from Tony Wright. Just something a bit lacking about the album and e that became even more apparent on the live album at the time, On the Road, which was a bit lacklustre. Uh, nothing major missing, but uh, compare the epic title track of Low Spark to the title track here and this one comes up short. Um, and this is also missing like the Capaldi uh, stomping rockers like Rock and Roll Stew and Light Up or Leave Me Alone. And even Winwood's ballads sound a little bit tired and he's even calling one of the songs, sometimes I feel so uninspired. So that doesn't exactly inspire you to, to be cheered up. Um, Quite a decent instrumental, Tragic Magic, and Evening Blue is a decent ballad. Roll Right Stones is good. There's nothing terribly wrong with it. It's just a slight disappointment after Low Spark, and then they would recover form with When Eagle Flies, in my opinion. Um, then we've got Super Trump's uh, follow-up to Breakfast in America. Well, this was eagerly anticipated by me because I'd gone into Super Trump around the time of breakfast, and this album didn't come out for three years, after, three years later. So by which time I'd got all the albums and was, uh, you know, I'd got Paris and um, I wasn't really aware of the strife that they were under and I, got, I went to see them on this 83 tour. So I went out and bought this album and I remember being quite pleased with it, but uh, looking back, um, Roger and Rick are not working particularly well together. They're working, they're supporting each other as session musicians, but they're not. I think the spark had gone and the love of creating albums had gone and they were to split up or Roger was to leave after this album. Um, having said that, it's got some five star tracks like it's, it's Rainy Again and Know Who You Are from Roger. And My Kind of Lady from Rick is, is decent but it was inevitably that the, they had to come down off the, 
after that four album sustained peak of crime crisis, Koalas Moments and Breakfast, uh, it had to come to an end and unfortunately it did slightly come to an end with Horrendous Last Words. Now the next one, the last one on my some, somewhat disappointing is Bad Fingers self-titled from 74 signed here by Joey Molland. So this was a, a letdown compared to the stellar collection of albums they put out for Apple, Magic Christian, No Dice, Straight Up and Ass. And uh, they were very much hurried into the recording studio, studio to make their first album for Warners. And uh, the results show it's uninspired, very few standout tracks, not without its merits, like any Bad Finger album. Lonely You is great. Uh, Give It Up from Joey is great. But uh, not, not too many highlights. So now we're into the A category. And I was going to have Blonde on Blonde, the follow up to Highway 61. But I've chosen one from the 70s, perhaps a slightly less obvious one. So many times Bob did this, put out a great album and just followed it up with a just as good a one. And, and the thing about Desire is it followed up Blood on the Tracks, came out in January 76, a year after Blood on the Tracks. And it not only maintained the songwriting quality, but it, it brought something new to the table in terms of the, the kind of folksy production and the Scarlet Rivera um, violin and Emmylou Harris on Backy Vocals, who I've started listening to her solo work, and thanks for those of you who recommended albums. I've been working my way through and, and enjoying it. Uh, just superb addition, uh, superb inspired decision to include Scarlett and Emmylou on this album. They really stamped their, their mark on it. And um, yeah, this album's every bit as good as Blood on the Tracks, and that is saying something. Uh, Black Diamond Bay, one more cup of coffee, perhaps my highlights, but there's no weak track on here. Um, Sarah at the end is just stunning. So that now we've got ACDC following up, probably my favorite ACDC album, Power Edge from 1978, following it up with Highway to Hell the following year and just matching the standard of the predecessor very strongly. Um, the last album before Bon Scott passed away and uh, their last truly great album, in my opinion. And again, not a weak track here. The title track, Girls Got a Rhythm, Walk All Over You, Touch Too Much. Shot Down in Flames, If You Want Blood, uh, Love Hungry Man, I just love it. I think it's a very strong, very, very strong album. Now, people were complaining I didn't have the stones on my previous video, so here we have them. The follow-up to Sticky Fingers, Exile Main Street, 1972. I know not everyone likes this album. It's a little bit of an acquired taste. But I think it's a very strong follow-up, and I think it was the, the end of their great, their truly great streak, which was Beggar's Banquet, Let It Bleed, Sticky Fingers, and this one. I think uh, that was a four-album streak, which is uh, very hard to beat. And uh, I think, I mean, particularly strong opener to the album with Rocks Off, just um, matching anything from Sticky Fingers, and then um, Rip This Joint follows... Um, Tumbling Dice at the end of side one is just one of their best rockers chugging along very nicely. Does, do, done, too lap, done too fast in concert when they did it in concert, but just at the right pace here. And um, Sweet Virginia, the beginning of side two, is just awesome. Hilarious words, Torn and Frayed, um, Loving Cup. Um, and then side three's got Ventilator Blues, which is one of the songs which when Bob Dylan was asked what, what Stone songs he wished he'd written, he, he chose Angie Wild Horses, which are quite obvious, and Vent Ventilator Blues from side three of here, so that was interesting. Uh, good track. And then, um, what did I not mention? Loving Cup, Let It Loose. Uh, all Down the Line, Soul Survivor. Just a really good mood to the album and an admirable double. Um, now we've got Neil Young's follow-up to one of my favourites, Comes a Time, the 78 album, with Russ Never Sleeps. And this was right back to standard. To, I mean, matching Comes a Time, but maybe even surpassing it, because it's got an absolutely timeless Neil Young track, the Oh My, 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 Hey, Hey, Out of the Blue, and then Into the Black at the end. Um, Powder Finger is one of his top five, ten tracks of all time. And other ones like Thrasher and, um, how do you pronounce it, Pocahontas, Pocahontas, uh, 
and sail away are also extremely strong. So I and then he made the the film to go with the album, and there's an album Live Rust which which accompanies that uh, with similar track listing and a few other few oldies thrown in. So that was a really strong album from Bob from 19, uh, from Neil from 1979. <laughs> And then at the top of the, uh, the last one we're going to talk about, which maintains the high standard, is Paul Simon's follow-up to his self-titled debut from 72. This is the following years. There goes Rhyming Simon. And uh, it's just chock-a-block of melody, uplifting tunes, nice arrangements, uh, muscle shoal um, horn players. American tune is just a tune to die for with Del Newman doing the strings. Take Me to the Mardi Gras is just perfection. Kodachrome is a brilliant opening to the album. One Man's Ceiling, Another Man's Floor. Just one track after track, Tenderness with the Dixie Hummingbirds singing along. Um, St. Judy's Comet, learning how, Learn How to Fall, uh, Loves Me Like a Rock. I mean, the self-titled album is probably I don't know, it depends what mood you're in. It's a darker album and this is more uplifting. So it, if you're in a mood to be uplifted, then put on this a nice sunny day. In fact, for this time of year, this is a superb album to put on in the car or in the garden. Uh, but that first solo album, the 72 one, is also a five star classic. So that was my list, my part two list here. Uh, again, just taken from my collection. Hope you enjoyed it. Don't have to agree with my views, but uh, horses for courses, as they say. So thank you for watching. See you next time.